Hey, do they work? I'm Tara. That doesn't seem right. Uh, sorry, I'm Miriam. Um, I work at Oddbird. I do like Beyonce and nail art. So um, I got my own Beyonce picture up there because I'm not a lazy. I know what I'm doing. Um, I work at Oddbird. I founded this company. We do client services, uh, small team, full stack. I can put this down now that I'm walking around and presenting. Um, I recently started learning JavaScript, but I didn't learn it. I was only introduced to it. JavaScript seems to be the one language that is unlearnable. Um, but I've been doing CSS and HTML for quite a long time. Uh, I mainly became known for my open source work doing Suzy, and if you don't know what that is, it's something, it's a grid system, don't use it. Um, we're past that. Uh, let's get to the mission statement of this. Thanks, Tim. Um, let's talk about CSS. Uh, and we're gonna go back, we're gonna talk about some history, um, not this history. Uh, we're gonna look at HTML first off. Um, it came out in 1993, that's when the first spec uh, was solidified. Um, that's also, I think this is actually 94, this is me starting my company with my brothers, uh, doing some client work there. It's definitely not Magic the Gathering. Um, in 1997, we got fonts and table uh, tags, yeah! Um, who got to work with uh, the font and table? Yes, good. Oh, a number of you. Um, I was learning at this point, but I uh, never had to do it on client work. Um, oh yeah, tables. There we go. Uh, and if nobody's yelled it at you recently, tables are for data. Um, but at that point, we were using them for layout. Um, and then finally, in uh, 1996, or really more in 2000, um, 96, we got the spec. 2000, we got implementation in most browsers. Um, we finally got cascading style sheets. Um, the end. Uh, any questions? <laughs> um, so cascading style sheets were designed to give us a way to do design systems. Uh, we wanted to be able to abstract out the design uh, from the elements themselves and reuse patterns. Um, but then uh, we did that following the principle of least power, uh, which is this idea that we should always use programming languages that are as weak as possible. Uh, to solve the problem that we need to solve. Um, so CSS is as unpowerful as, as it can be to solve our problems, and that's been the goal from the beginning. Um, and our problems are changing now, and so is CSS. Um, but it's good to remember that's where it came from. You've all seen this. Yeah, it's a feature. Um, if your design language couldn't do that, you'd be frustrated. What if you want overflow? Uh, in a box that is exact height and width. Um, that's a good thing. If InDesign didn't do that, you would ditch InDesign. InDesign does allow you to make a box and have text go outside of it. That's a good feature. Um, so now that that's over with, um, how many of you were, um, ever read the article on uh, List Apart, A DAO of Web Design by John Ossop? This was way back when CSS first came out, nobody. Um, it's still worth a read, a few. Um, so this was uh, John presenting CSS and how we could rethink about the web um, instead of doing uh, fixed sizes and thinking of it like print, which has this really heavily controlled page that we know exactly what it's gonna be every time. He was proposing that that is a weakness of print and that now we can do something better, which is we can make dynamic styles uh, that change for every user, depending on their context, depending on their device, their language, uh, et cetera. So thinking of control as a limitation of the printed page, and now we have the lack of control, and that's more exciting. Um, so this is another piece of that origin of CSS, how we think about CSS when we use it. Um, around 2007, 2010, we got the major grid frameworks, um, Blueprint, OOCSS, 960, um, there were a few others. Uh, as far as I recall, besides Eric Meyer's reset, these were some of the first open source tools for CSS specifically. 
Uh, and the way that that works, because CSS only has one API, uh, you get selectors, um, and they have properties in them. Um, so it's a bunch of predefined classes, and you can apply them to your HTML. Um, and when those came out, uh, that's when I was actually starting my company. So um, it made sense to me that frameworks came out then. Uh, at that point, we were using floats for most of our layouts. And uh, every time you applied a float, you had to apply display inline. And there were various hacks you had to do to handle different box models. So every single floated element had four or five lines of uh, identical hacks that you just had to do over and over. Um, and frameworks made that go away, right? Uh, suddenly, we're not repeating this code. We've written it once. It's there. We don't need to worry about it. Um, we'll apply some uh, frameworks. Around that time, also, Natalie Downs started pushing back against that. This talk that she gave in London, I wasn't there, but I saw it online. Thank you for building the internet. Um, she gave this talk, pushing back on that idea and saying, what if instead we had reusable systems that were more flexible than a full framework? Um, they gave us more control over defining our own grids, defining our own layouts, uh, defining our own styles, but were consistent uh, in how we applied them, how we do naming. Um, so this is sort of the idea that I see leading to uh, BEM and SMACs and other naming systems in CSS, designing ways of doing it rather than frameworks that do it for you. Um, gives us a little more control. So she was saying, systems are more powerful than frameworks. And then she used fluid grids and pixel or M containers. Um, and she could uh, have lots of control over how things moved and also where they would stop moving. Um, and so I thought that was really interesting. It was sort of responsive before we actually had responsive trademark. Um, but the math was just ugly. I mean, I've simplified it here some. That's the basic algorithm. It's not super complex. Uh, you can type that into a calculator. But as soon as you start adding gutters, it gets complicated. And this is what my CSS looked like for a couple of years, uh, because we didn't have SAS at that point. And I was just typing these numbers into a calculator and putting the results. Uh, and this was a grid system entirely uh, in CSS. Um, then somebody showed me SAS. Uh, Compass and SAS sort of gained popularity around 2009. Suddenly, CSS is Turing complete, kind of, um, and we can do new things. Um, so here's the actual math written out using SAS. Not the initial syntax of SAS, but uh, the syntax now. Um, not a lot prettier, not great, being able to write it out like that. Um, so that's where Susie came from. Susie was an attempt to like, don't use it. Like, seriously, don't use it. Stop. You, like, there's so many downloads still every day. Stop. Uh, it looked like this. Um, so we were taking that, uh, that math, and we're trying to give it some meaning. We're trying to say, OK, I don't just need all these numbers calculated. This means something. It means I'm trying to span three columns of a 12-column grid. Um, it means I want to write a right margin that is the size of a gutter. Uh, we're talking about grids here, and we want to use language that's meaningful so we can read it. Um, that's the goal of any code, is we need it to be readable by humans and machines. Somebody said something like 90% of uh, working on code is refactoring. Um, I have no idea. That's, or 80. I, you know, like it's a made-up number. Who cares? Um, Make your code do more. Sorry you're so blurry, David, but that happens. Um, make your code do more. Uh, if it's readable to both humans and machines, if it's meaningful, if it says something, we can start automating from it. Um, that's a useful concept um, that David was talking about there. Uh, make your code do more. Give it meaning. Give it structure. You can reuse that structure to say new things. We're giving things names with SAS. We finally have variables. We can say um, this string of numbers in this HSL function, it refers to a specific, not just a color, but a concept for our site. It has a use. 
um, and that use is meaningful to us. Um, as Sarah Drasner says, code is communication. Um, she said that once and yells at me when I use it in talks because she's like, come on, I just said it one time. Don't care. Um, in 2009, we got media queries. That was fun. Finally, we can do responsive actually. Um, uh, soon after 2011, we get calc, which lets us actually mix um, fluid and static uh, units inside of CSS. So this has been around a long time. If you still think calc is not supported in browsers, it is very well supported and has been for some time, um, and allows you to say, I want, say, 100% minus 200 pixels. Uh, and the browser can figure out what that is. That's a calculation that SAS will never be able to do because SAS doesn't know what 100% means. Um, only the browser knows that. So Calc gives us that ability to do those mixed unit calculations um, and do some more complex layout work there, give it a little more meaning. Um, 2011, we also get the official responsive uh, TM. Thank you, Ethan Marcotte. Uh, which helps us solve this problem. All of the devices, everywhere, this is only a fraction of them. We're not just doing it for one orange guy with yellow hair. Uh, we're doing it for everybody. Yeah, you know that. Mauricio told you a little about that. Anyway, <laughs> don't be fooled. The, the syntax of CSS is declarative, and that sometimes makes it look simple. But CSS is not simple. CSS is very dynamic. It's all about how do we define how things are going to move and change across different devices, across different browsers, uh, in different languages. How are we going to change direction of the text and still have a nice layout? Um, all of these issues are dynamic issues. Uh, it's how do we handle change and chaos, and how do we give some structure to that? Um, so that's where we want to go with the flow. And if you don't remember, the flow is something like this. Objects stack up next to each other, and when one changes size, the others are able to flow around it, uh, which that gives us relationships between objects so that every time we change the size of our sidebar, we don't have to change all of the other sizes on the application. Uh, they have relationships to each other, and we can change one thing and watch everything else move around it. That's useful um, if we can stick with it. Um, so uh, responsive design was about fluid grids, flexible images, and media queries. Those were sort of the three pieces that Ethan Marcotte said, this is how we do responsive web design. Um, in 2012, we got Flexbox, which gives us more control on some layouts, but it all works in a single direction, and then wraps, uh, which is what we're used to. That's similar to how floats work, but we've got more layout control with it. So Flexbox is really useful, but it's still one-dimensional. We're not, we can't do alignment along those axes unless we force it like we did with floats, um, which is still where Flexbox is useful anytime you need single dimensional alignment, it's great. 2014, we got variables. Did you know it was that long ago? They are quite well supported, not entirely supported. I stopped showing can I use images here because they change every three weeks, and I'm like, I'm not gonna update that. Um, variables look like this in CSS. It's basically, uh, we've got, you know, property value, same as before. We're taking a browser prefix and we're removing the browser from it. So now it's just our prefix. Um, so we get that double dash instead of dash webkit dash. Um, and that's how we define it. So we can say, uh, we can give it any value. Um, any valid CSS is valid custom property. They're called custom properties as well as variables. If that's confusing, it's because Tab Atkins really wanted this powerful concept of custom properties where you can define your own CSS, um, and we'll get to that. Uh, and people said, no, it's too complex. And he said, what if I call it variables? And they loved the idea. Uh, so we got variables. He's working on the custom properties part. Um, that's coming. To call it to use a variable in CSS, we do this um, var function. Uh, 
takes the first argument as the name of our custom property, and the second argument is a fallback value. So if the property is undefined or has an invalid value, we'll fall back to the second one in the list, um, which can be quite handy. Um, and we can sort of set up a stack of them that way if we define stacks of variables. In some ways, that's similar to SAS. We're still naming things. We're still taking a value, giving it a name. Uh, we have more dry code because um, uh, we have this way of storing data inside of a variable. That's useful. Um, dry, dry code. We're not repeating ourselves as much. But there's a big difference. SAS variables scope. They follow the cascade. And that means suddenly something that broke in SAS. And running Suzy, this was a question I got regularly, is when I change my variable at the media query, why doesn't that change for all of the values inside of the media query? And it's because SAS has no idea. SAS is scoped the same way that JavaScript is scoped. It's based on the file, the, the local context. Um, but CSS doesn't scope to the local context. It scopes to the browser, and that works differently. So they inherit, uh, and you can change them at a media query, uh, and that change will trickle down to everything that uses, um, uses that property inside of uh, those parameters. Um, so that's a very different way of thinking about how variables are scoped and how they're used. Um, and so both can still be useful because they solve slightly different problems. Um, they also, by default, uh, inherit. And so if we put them on our root selector, variables will inherit everywhere. They'll be available to everything. This is a good way to set sort of your brand config that's not going to change. Um, if you want them to not inherit, you can reset them on every element in the site. So this is a good way to say some variables shouldn't inherit because properties like background and margin, it doesn't make sense to use inheritance on stuff like that. Um, so sometimes you do want to inherit, and sometimes you want to reset on every element. Uh, they make This is one of my favorite uses of them. And where we're already using them in production, they really help solve this problem of communication between JavaScript and CSS. Uh, so when I want to get a value from my JavaScript to my CSS, I create a variable, and I pass it through, and it's totally safe. It's safe in that uh, normally when you do inline styles, they're impossible to override from anywhere else um, because they have such a high specificity. But it's OK if your variable gets a high specificity. You can just ignore it. You can just not use it. So it's safe to pass in a variable, and then in your CSS, you can use it if you want to, or you can just say, I don't want to use it. I'm going to use my own color set in the CSS. So it's really easy to still keep the control in the CSS about when you're accepting data from JavaScript and when you're not. Um, that's a nice use case. This is another one that we use quite a bit. If you don't want to do this sort of nesting to say, this button is actually red, you can instead say, buttons generally have a background color of the button color variable, which falls back to blue. And then you can say, inside of this, the button color is red. Uh, and that variable will trickle down. We've still not increased specificity. We're still at a single class or tag name. Uh, and we've totally changed the color of all the buttons inside of uh, this, which is well named. Naming things is easy, right? Um, it also solves this problem of missing longhand. Uh, so you can use it to create like shadow Y value that you can change just a single value in a longer property. Um, since box shadow has no way to change single values, you can create your own there. Um, that's also useful inside of transforms uh, and various other places. Um, you can use it to create mix-ins where every property needs the same value. So for auto prefixing, um, I would just keep using auto prefixer. But you can do this. Uh, and if you run into another use case uh, where this is useful, this is a way to do all of that purely in CSS. Um, we start combining it with calc. We can do more things. We can start playing with how variables relate to each other and 
and get calculations off of them. I was playing with that, and I totally rebuilt Suzy just using CSS. This has no SAS involved, um, and it does all of the things that Suzy can do. It's also, CSS is also generating the background image that gives us uh, the gray colors that makes sure that we're aligning to the grid. Um, all of that is possible in CSS, and it looks something like this. Uh, we can set our, uh, our config for Suzy the same way that we do in Suzy itself, uh, except using CSS instead of SAS. And then I have all these functions internally that you ignore um, that do the calculations. So I'm using CSS variables with calc as their own functions to do the math uh, and return the values. And then to use it, uh, you do something like this. You say how many columns are available, and then you can change how many you want to span, and uh, you can change the number of columns inside of a span, so you can start doing nesting. Um, that looks pretty nice to me. You still shouldn't use this. Uh, what, the problem with Suzy is it tries to solve all, everything, every layout, and you don't need to solve every layout. You have your own layouts. Uh, so you can probably build something quite a bit smaller, quite a bit faster, uh, that does the same things, gives you the same syntax, um, or you can use CSS Grid, which we'll get to. Um, yeah, so it also generates the background images uh, using a gradient, um, and I told you that. Uh, this is another toy that I've been playing with recently. Uh, somebody did a demo on CSS tricks. I linked to their article in the slides. Um, the idea here is that we can use radial values uh, and then multiplication to trigger on-off switches. Um, radial values are like the, the hue wheel. Um, if you go above 360, you just keep going around the wheel. If you go below zero, you just keep going around the wheel. Um, uh, with lightness and darkness, if you go over 100, you stay at 100. And if you go under zero, you stay at zero. So with both of those, they accept values outside of the range, and you can use that to your advantage. Um, so the clamped values then give you this on-off switch, um, and this is what you get, an ability to set a threshold of lightness at which you would like the text to flip from white to black, which is not a perfect way to do accessibility. Uh, lightness doesn't reflect exactly what we mean when we're talking about um, uh, accessible text, uh, but it gets us close. Um, and it's all happening just inside of CSS. Uh, and when we change the hue, we can also use math uh, calc values to generate uh, uh, the complement. Um, JavaScript does have ways of interacting with this. I've not played with them, so, you know, you're on your own. Um, they look something like this. Um, sorry, I was only introduced. I didn't learn it. Um, there's a few issues. Um, CSS doesn't know the types of values yet. Uh, CSS is going to learn that. That's, some, that's coming. That's uh, part of what's coming in Houdini. Um, they also don't work inside of URL. You can't call a, var a variable inside URL, which is really too bad, because I'm various times passing in images to my CSS, uh, and I would like that. Hopefully, that that's coming once we have typed uh, values. And then you can't do this sort of interpolation where you say, give me the variable and add the m unit to it. Uh, in order to do that, you would have to say calc this variable times 1m, and then it will add the units, uh, which can be useful. It's hard to take units away. So often when I'm creating variables, the unit, uh, it'll, they'll be unitless. And then when, once I need them, I'll add the units at the last minute. So, calc variable times units. Um, Houdini is coming. Uh, we, he didn't really dig into it much, um, but mentioned it some. Uh, it will give us more. There's um, this properties and values API, which will let us define quite a bit of detail around our custom properties uh, so that we're, uh, so that they're typed um, and they can even have validation, syntax validation. That's on the way but not there yet. That's the future. We get jetpacks. And also CSS Grid. Uh, 
which uh, landed last year. It was really like in one weekend. Uh, we suddenly had CSS Grid in three browsers. I fell asleep one night not being able to use Grid. I woke up the next morning and started putting Grid in production. It was crazy. Um, but CSS Grid is fairly well supported already uh, because it landed so quickly. And there is nothing like it at all. If you think it looks like tables, uh, take another look. It goes way deeper. There's way more you can do. The spec can be complex, and some people will give you talks where they dig into the spec, and that can feel daunting. Um, there are ways to get into it much simpler. There's ways to start using it right away and provide fallbacks. It's like some of it is so, it's making layout so easy we're all going to get fired, and I'm scared. Um, we define grids on containers, so we say it's, this container is a grid, uh, and then we can define the columns, we can define rows as well, and we can define gaps between them. We don't have to do any more of that math to calculate gutters. Um, optionally, we can return control of a layout to the elements inside, the child elements, um, by using auto as a, as a width or height value. Um, for our grid, and that will return elements to the flow and use their uh, default flow values um, to define the grid. Um, you might see these various units that are coming up. Um, so we've got uh, percentages we've had for a long time. VW uh, landed a couple years ago, and now we have fractions. Um, these are all uh, these are all percentages. These are all fractions of space. Um, so that can be confusing. Um, the one is relative to the parent, one is relative to the viewport, and one is relative to remaining space. Uh, so once everything else has been calculated, what space is remaining, that's what a fraction unit refers to, similar to unitless values uh, in Flexbox. Um, you might run into issues with one fraction actually means min-max auto one fraction, which can be problematic. It means things can grow, but they can't shrink. If you want things to shrink, you have to specify that by saying, well, I want a minimum of zero and a maximum of one fraction, and then you get both growing and shrinking. Um, grids end up like this. You get lines in both directions. They're one indexed, and then they're also negative one indexed, and that's how we start doing layout with them. Uh, we can also define these ASCII uh, art um, layouts where we give every section a name. You can't do L's or anything weird like that, but as long as everything is in the line, um, we can name our spaces and then uh, layout is as simple as this. We just say, which grid area does it go in? And we give it the name. Uh, and suddenly we have the full layout. Uh, and that's really it. Those, those are the lines of code to get this and it's totally flexible. Um, so Jen Simmons is talking about intrinsic web design. I'm about out of time, so I'm going to skim through it real quick. We get fluid values and fixed values uh, working together um, because we have these stages of squishiness. We've got fixed units. We've got fraction units. We have min-max, which lets us be fluid until we're not fluid anymore. Um, we have minimums and maximums. And we have auto, which returns us to the default flow. Um, so this is going beyond what we could do before. Uh, the layouts are truly two-dimensional. Uh, we get alignment on both axes by default, uh, unlike Flexbox. And this is the main difference uh, that we look at for whether something is going to use Flexbox or not. Um, we get in, uh, nested contexts, so we can start putting Flexbox items inside of grid items and then float inside of that. We can mix all these things together and get quite dynamic layouts. Um, and then everything is able to expand and contract. We can deal with justification. We can deal with wrapping. We have more control over all of these aspects of layout. And then media queries, rather than being central to this, we just use them as needed. We get keywords like autofit and autofill, which just determine the number of columns that we want based on the space available. And then we don't need a media query to tell us to reset the number of columns uh, we just get enough for whatever space there is. But what I started playing with is this idea of putting the two together. So taking variables and grid and doing these data-driven layouts, where I can say, I want to do a schedule app. Um, and this is actually one that we have in production. Um, I want a schedule app uh, that says, 
uh, what is the start time 30 minutes into the day, and then what is the duration of the event. The event is 60 minutes, and uh, we, in an hour, laid out our app uh, with the entire schedule laying out and working and filling in the gaps because Grid can do that. Uh, and all we did was take those variables and apply them. I've also played with that with bar, bar charts. This is another example of basically the same idea. I'm passing in a scale, and I'm passing in two values. Um, and then I just say, OK, I want it to start at the scale plus 1 because it's 1 indexed, and then minus the value. And that's where it's going to start, and it's going to go to the end. And there I go. And then these backgrounds are also using that same data. I'm just passing in those two values for each element here. What's the scale and what's this value? And I'm generating the background color based on that, uh, as well as um, the layout there. Uh, there's a lot more you can do with that. So the last, I talked in Argentina a couple weeks ago, and somebody was talking about uh, data visualizations. And I was like, oh, I bet I can do that. So um, first I tried line graphs. This one I did today. Um, you can play with it. There's, uh, we can regenerate the data. And because it's all in CSS, I get those animations free just using transition. You can't transition the variable itself. You have to transition the property the variable is used on. Um, but you get those nice transitions when the data changes, which this data is so meaningful and useful. Number one is like way up there. Um, we got this data which I had to use view to do the animations because uh, I'm actually laying out on the grid with this one. The other one is just using percentages. So this is using a grid um, and then changing the size, the color, and the placement. Um, I saw this yesterday uh, in your talk, and I really wanted to do it, but I didn't get around to it. Uh, it looks hard, but I think we could do it. We'll see. Um, this was another one that I saw at a talk. This isn't data visualization, but this is uh, just a generated art um, that, to me, looked like a grid and some randomness. And I thought, great, I can do that in Vue. So I set this up. If I click on one, it changes the invader. And then I can, yeah, let's add some. No, let's get rid of them. Um, here. Let's kick ass. Yes. Yeah. Get the invaders. All right. Um, so there's a lot you can do there. Um, the CSS doesn't have a way to do random numbers yet, uh, but SAS does. So I'm using SAS to set the variables uh, you, with these random numbers and then pass them in, and CSS does the rest. Houdini will give us the ability to define um, custom functions inside of CSS eventually, so we will get our random function eventually. We just don't have it yet. Um, Mauricio has more demos that involve lots of movement um, and actually motion sensing, um, so you can play with those. I've already tweeted the link to my slides so you can find all these links. Um, check out the videos of Leah Veru if you're interested in CSS variables. Uh, she live codes all of her talks, and they're amazing, and she'll give you much more detail than I did. Gridbyexample.com uh, gives you pre-built layouts as well as uh, simple introductions to each part of uh, the grid uh, layout. Um, so you can learn from Rachel Andrew there. You can also cut and paste cu uh, common layouts with their fallback values, um, which is real handy. Jen Simmons has a lot. If you check out her website, she has a lab of experiments, which is fun. Um, she also has Layout Land, which is a series of YouTube videos about web layout. So those are worth watching. So just want to finish by saying CSS really is awesome. So go have fun with it. Thank you. I love the depth and breadth, or is it breadth and depth? I'm not sure which of the CSS properties uh, this applies to of your talk. Really love the fact that every aspect of front-end development is going to a place that gives us more control, more power, 
And the best part of this, as usual, is that so much of this, our learning, our education, and so on, is driven by us in the community sharing our experience with each other. Miriam, thank you very much. Now, I actually predicted this. I said when I was talking um, to our speakers in advance that sometimes the more um, dense talks got the least questions because people are sitting there going, wow. And I have a feeling that's the case here because I haven't seen a lot of questions uh, so far. But here's one that we did discuss. And I love this because I think I know what these words are, and I'm going to pretend that I know what they are, but I don't know much about them. Uh, when would you use Flexbox versus Grid versus Floats? Yeah. Um, so Floats are really great at doing what they were meant to do, which is floating an image in some text. Uh, they do that beautifully. That's what they're made for. There's a few other things that they do nicely that are more complex. Um, so there are some times when you'll be like, well, a float can do this, and I can't figure out a way to do this uh, with anything else. Um, but floats I almost never use now, uh, just for those very specific things. Um, Flexbox I use in one dimension, uh, and when I, don't, when I don't need alignment on two dimensions. So it, it can wrap, but I don't need everything lined up two-dimensionally. In fact, usually it's when I insist I don't want them lined up. <laughs> um, when I do want things lined up in both rows and in columns, then grid is much more powerful. Awesome. Thank you.